Ooh. Yeah. Okay. First up, uh, roll call and seating of alternates. I'm just looking at my screen here. Who um, do we Powell have? is not present. Uh -huh. Bob is not present. So Justin, I'll seat you for Bob. Okay, and I see other mem members of the public logged on. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for your patience. Okay, first up, any changes to the agenda, Paula? None for me. Anyone from any of the other members? Nope. Okay. Uh, the minutes of June 28th, 2021. Any corrections? I'll make a motion we accept the minutes as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Okay. That appears unanimous. Next up, audience of citizens. Anything anyone would like to bring up to us that isn't already on our agenda? Okay. Uh, next, we're going to reconvene the public hearing for Hop River LLC, a four lot subdivision application on Hop River Road. Property address is 127 Route 6, Assessors Map 8, Lot 16A. Probably, um, Paula, would you like to say anything first, or should we turn this over to the applicant? Um, I'll just say a few things. We um, um, were continue the hearing um, through tonight. Um, our, this is the last night of the statutory limits without a, another extension. Um, last uh, Thursday, the first, Wes Wentworth, Mark Walter, and John Valenti walked the site to look at the possible driveway access for lot three that would also protect the archaeological sites. Um, they agreed that because the town will be constructing a gravel driveway into the site, that lot three could use that driveway for access to the rear of uh, the lot three property. Um, and John Valenti felt that the driveway would be an acceptable crossing of the sluiceway with wetlands approval. Um, and then on Friday, Mark Walter and Beth Lunt, the DPW director also walked the site to look at it, the same thing. And then last Thursday, Wes Wentworth, Mark Walter, and I uh, met in the afternoon uh, to fine tune some of the, the, the actually outline of the um, site, which we just received plans today. Um, I sent them out to everyone and, and Wes, I'm sure has them to, to pull up. Um, the, everything else seems to be set. I think we've got uh, a good handle on open space as of now. But um, certainly leave that up to you guys. But we'll, um, I think we're, we're in a, a good position in terms of the information that we have. Okay. Um, you all set any, anything else from commission members? With that, uh, uh, I would assume that the applicant would like to, or their representative would like to speak to this, uh, what the revisions have been and so on. Yes. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Wes Wentworth, Wentworth Civil Engineers from Lebanon. I'm here on behalf of the owner and applicant, Hop River LLC. Sal Giuliano from Hop River LLC is here on uh, the meeting as well. Uh, I shared a screen here, which is the most uh, uh, recent revision. Um, Paula pretty much covered everything, so I'm gonna be very, very quick. Uh, our revisions were just relative to the open space and the access. So I'm just going to zoom in to that area. Um, and as she said, we walked the site with John Valente, the wetlands agent, town wetlands agent, and Mark Walters and myself. And what we're looking for is a location for a town access into the site. Um, over here in the east end of the open space is the uh, kind of it's an open field fronting on the Hop River that would be best suited for recreational use for, for, for the town. Um, and uh, we came up with a place where the town could um, construct a new access way to get around the old mill site without disturbing any foundations, uh, head walls, raceways, et cetera. And um, there's a disturbed portion of the sluiceway. Uh, it's been 
partially filled over the years still would require more filling. It would require a wetlands permit for the town to construct that in the future. But uh, again, John Valente, as Paula stated, felt that uh, that, that was a reasonable um, uh, request for a future permitted use. Um, as part of that town roadway, there would be an easement over that uh, to allow lot three the same access to their river frontage, which is over to the east of the proposed open space um, by using that same road and therefore avoiding any of the historical um, uh, mill site areas. Um, the only last thing I would add is that uh, there could be some, should the commission choose to approve this and subdivision moves forward, open space is needed to the town, there could be some time delay until such time that the that road is actually installed by the public works department. Um, might be six months, might be 18 months. In the meantime, we would just like a, a, a right to pass and repass the way um, the cars and, and vehicles have been driving through there um, temporarily in, until that road is, is, is installed. So we would like lot three to be able to continue to access its front end as it does now. Um, no maintenance, no, no installation of driveways or anything, just pass and repass as it has in a temporary nature. Um, because where we're showing that road now um, could could not be accessed with with a vehicle should any any maintenance be required. So um, in doing this, we've also uh, slightly revised the open space layout, um, and we've extended the the river frontage about 20 feet, and uh, all the numbers are the same as far as 15% open space. Um, et cetera, all the required subdivision calculations are, are still being met. So that's all I have to add and be glad to take any comments or questions. Okay. I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, I uh, want to open this up to commission questions and then we'll open it up to the public questions and uh, at any point. Uh, so commission members, anything? Comments, questions? Yeah, my, my understanding is that the uh, wetlands feels that that won't be a, a big issue to uh, to get a permit to go across the uh, the old sluiceway. That, that is what John Valente, the town wetlands agent, um, certainly has decades of experience in that uh, with the town of Columbia. He, he felt that that was not a, not a big deal. Okay. And I spoke with him as well and, and got the same information that, that Wes just shared. Um, it would be the town doing it, so it's uh, a little bit different than having a, a, um, an outsider uh, applying to the wetlands. Uh, wetlands you mean a non-government entity? A non-government entity, yes. Okay. Uh, so okay. I, I have a question. Is the landowner satisfied with this setup? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, that's good. Okay, any other questions, comments from commission members? I have one. Uh, the, it's crossing over the Seuss Way. I assume they're gonna put culverts in there adequate enough for drainage? Right then, now that, that Seuss Way to the east of where this crossing is, again, this crossing has been slightly filled, maybe halfway or something, I don't know, uh, up to two feet in places deep. The actual water is in place to the east. It's being backfed from the river. And then there's a, about a 30 foot wide fill through here. that's not allowing any water to between where this driveway is and the head wall now. There's no water coming through the raceway under the site. The upstream end has been plugged off. So there's really just a little bit of groundwater in this wetland area that's the former uh, sluice way to the west of this proposed crossing. John Valente did say, well, wouldn't be a bad idea to throw a small culvert pipe in there um, just to balance the water out, but there's there's not large amount, there's there's no water coming out of that head wall or that that raceway right now. It's just it's just groundwater only. So uh, we would kind of leave that to the wetlands commission, whichever they would want uh, when when the town moves forward with that. In my opinion, it could go either way. It's not a bad idea to put a, a culvert in there just to let the balance the water out on both sides, but it it wouldn't be necessary. It's, it's essentially plugged off now and there's no signs of water running through that area uh, in the field. 
Wes, I have Tom Curry. I have one. Did, did anybody check it out this past weekend? Uh, no, but it had rained significantly uh, prior to yeah, I know. when we were out there. But at, after that uh, dolly wumper we had, no, I, I haven't been back out there. <laughs> Wondering. Okay. Any other questions, comments from commission members? I had a question. Yes, Vera. Uh, has anybody reviewed uh, the wordage on this easement paperwork? No, I, I have not. I, that, so that would be a plan. Part of the plan. Okay. Um, okay. I, I have a question of the applicant, if you don't mind. Um, Wes, uh, Mr. Wentworth, uh, the verbiage in the proposed easement, is that the result of something that you crafted? Uh, yes, I was just trying to, obviously we're not, um, uh, it's, it, it would have to be finalized and, and uh, agreed upon between town council and the, uh, the uh, attorney of the- Would you mind uh, reading African. that aloud or where, show us where on the plans, the verbiage of that might be, and maybe that could address Vera's question. And sure. in mind, I had the same thought. Yeah, I, I had at last meeting submitted a, a document with our, our thoughts, which was basically a right to pass and repass, a right to construct up to a 12 foot wide gravel driveway within the easement, um, access for vehicles. Um, that, that was the intent. Um, it would more or less be like a standard driveway easement uh, that you would see uh, on any uh, uh, other subdivision to a typical private lot. Uh, the only exception is there's there's no um, provision for any utilities underground or above ground because there's there's uh, no reason that I could foresee that would be needed. So it's again it's just a right to pass and repass um, ability to construct a gravel driveway in that area should the town not do so. It seems as though they would, um, and 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 to maintain that. So again, I'd submitted that at the last meeting, and uh, I, I have no other changes. Okay. As far as hey, yeah, Paula, I'm, I'm just no, I was ahead. just going to follow follow up just for a second. I was a little concerned about the disruption of uh, of the historical part of the site, and I'm looking forward to the uh, impact from the uh, open space and the historical commission. Okay. Um, is, is there any language for uh, that that we could take a look at for the proposed temporary easement? Um, no, no, I don't have any. Wes, can you, sh can you use your little hand and show where the, the gravel driveway goes currently? Right now? Right uh, now. It, it, it comes in more or less straight down, very near the head wall. And then right in at this point, it just turns to a, to a mowed field. Okay, so uh, it comes in right about where this ex proposed one comes in, heads down. Curves a little bit to the right, crosses near uh, where here's where that head wall is right in there. So again, there's, there's wheel tracks in there. It's historically been driven on uh, for decades. Uh, so it's, it's nothing new is being created there. And lot three would be able to continue on yeah. down to lot three, down to the yeah. edge of the end of the open space on the yeah. across the field. Yep, yeah. they just don't want to be locked out. Um, right. should, yeah. should, the, should the town not move forward or, or, or have to de right. severely delay uh, the and, installation of that room? And the, my understanding is the town doesn't plan on when it does do a build a driveway, um, they wouldn't be building anything all the way to the end of lot three. It would probably be, you know, about where you've got the 25 foot mark. Yeah, they, they'd and, indicate getting across that sluiceway into this field area. Yep. And so then at that point, the soils are such you could you could drive a vehicle on that all year. Uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a loamy gravelly area. But um, should they find that it, it it's running or, or not acceptable, they could choose to extend that driveway. Lot three that is. Did but anything in the in the proposed right of way, um, we would be enjoined from likely making any sort of permanent improvement area. So what, what's the reason for it being 25 feet? Is that just 25 feet wide? Is that just convention? Yeah, as you can see, this is a very, mm -hmm. this isn't a straight line in and out. 
Um, we have many curves. We're trying to really fit this in surgically to um, be able to uh, access the site with minimum impact. Uh, my experience is, is uh, on rear drives, old easements, things like this through the years, um, you know, these subdivisions have been approved for years with um, easements. It's, it's pretty difficult to keep a 12 foot driveway that's taking corners within a 25 foot easement. Uh, often uh, people get outside of that if they're, if they're not careful and don't have it staked. Uh, when you narrow it down to 20 feet or, or less, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the, to fit a, tw a windy 12 foot easement in 25 is a comfortable space. Um, on this last straight run through here, um, that would be easier to, to reduce down to, to, to 20 feet or so. Um, but everywhere else, but between the crossing, over the crossing, uh, back to the road, you can see it's windy. We have an S turn in here and it's, it's just difficult to, to nail that down. And I'm, okay. I'm presuming in the easement that the um, uh, people that are using the open space would be able to, to walk on this driveway and, and, and go across it. It is an exclusive use just for lot three. That, that is correct. They, they would not have a right to, to build a fence or, or keep any town people out of that space. They just, it just gives them the, in, to, the right to pass through there. Um, and it, it basically keeps the town from being able to, to block off uh, access to Route 3 is, is the real intent to, to Lot 3 run. It, it's probably safer too if somebody's walking up there and, and the S turns and somebody's driving in to be able to squeeze by each other. Okay. And, and I know some areas are, will be tight in there. Uh, like, let me open this up if I could. I don't want to cut off uh, any commission discussion or questions. Uh, is everyone good to open this up to public comment questions? Um, I just, before we move into that, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. Um, some of the things that would be decided after um, the hearing is closed and after even the, a, a decision is made by PZC, um, we, we still would need to determine the amount of the performance bond for the dry hydrant because the dry hydrant probably isn't going to go in for uh, maybe two years because the town's in the process of redoing that bridge. Um, and you don't want to put something in that you then just take right out again when you're rebuilding the bridge. Um, and the amount has to be determined by planning and zoning commission that um, the uh, applicant will, will uh, uh, give us a performance bond. Um, and we'll need to come up with uh, easement language for the temporary easement that gives grant uh, lot three access ac across the property down the, the gravel driveway uh, to, to lot three. Uh, until we build a road um, and that the agreement needs to be reviewed by the town attorney and approved by, both by the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Board of Selectmen. Um, and the same thing with a permanent easement. It probably be one document, um, but a permanent easement um, across the, the road that the town will build. I'm sorry, not the road, the driveway the town will build. Um, and that too would be reviewed by the town attorney and approved by Planning and Zoning and the Board of Selectmen. All right. Anything else to bring up? No, thank you. Okay, with that said, why don't we move into public uh, questions and comment? Uh, any, we... any comments from the, or questions how, from the public? How do we get in there? Okay, raise their hand. Is that, oh. yeah, bear with me. I can only see so many people at a time. <laughs> this is Joan. Yeah, I'm looking at how I raise my hand. The screen is still covered with this map, so I'm. Okay. I, Am I on? Joan, Joan, You're Joan, on. We'll Joan. Joan will I'm recognize on. you. Okay. okay. Well, Joan Hill. I, I could answer Mr. Courier's question about the flooding. Just for the record, the weekend. Uh, Joan. I, Joan. Oh, sorry. Joan, for the Joan record, Hill. Could you give... Yes, 23 Cards Mill Road, Columbia. Thank you. Sorry. So in response to Mr. Courier's question about the flooding over the past week, I have a photograph I'd be happy to share. It shows the extensive flooding on the current 
entrance road, I guess you'd call it, the one that they want to use temporarily. Um, pretty extensive. So I can if, do that if you want to share. If you can do that me. efficiently, that would be great. If not, I can, can I can try. If it doesn't work in one second, we'll just forget about that. But I can try if you give me the uh, screen. I have uh, stopped sharing the screen, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, photos. Okay. Uh, okay. Forget about it. It's not showing the ones. Okay. Why don't so you forget just describe it. it. Joan. I can, I can, yeah, well, so the area where you go from the, I guess you'd call it the cleared area into the meadow, probably flooded for about 40 feet as along that path. So about 25 feet into the meadow, about 15 feet before that. Um, and it was already going down when I got there. So there was another stain that made it bigger. So that would be an area where you have to worry about fill or something. It's, it's maybe not wetlands per se, but it's definitely flooding. So anyway, my questions have to do with the easement. Um, when it was read at the previous hearing, the words non-exclusive and unrestricted were applied to it. And I have concerns about both of those. Um, I believe it should be exclusive to the landowner and not something he could open to the public for recreation or an ATV course or whatever thoughts might come. And then unrestricted, you know, I believe the town wants to gate this road because they do not want the public driving in. And so that was something at the last meeting that the applicant said they would not agree to. And I think it's important if the town wants that, that they put that into the agreement. So, um, you know, okay. it may be the current owner may have thoughts about what he wants to do, but this is in perpetuity. And the next owner may have plans that you don't want parties at night with bonfires, uh, you know, fireworks, logging, gravel extraction, whatever. So I think you need to take those into consideration and make sure it's just a access for personal enjoyment of the owner and not, you know, anything else like that should require the town's permission to pass over. They're gonna bring in trucks or whatever. So that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Are you going to bed? Do I don't have to watch this? Yeah, town meeting. I don't know who that was. Okay. Any? Uh, is there anyone else who'd like to comment? I think I can see everybody in the meeting right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Walter, the town administrator. Mr. Walter. Thank you, Rick. Um, yes, uh, what Joan had mentioned is correct. We would prefer to keep a gate there. Um, anyone who wants access for camping, my thoughts are that would be a permitted access. You would have to have a reservation to camp there. But we would plan to have parking outside the gate. And that would allow access by walking into the area if you want to tube or fish or, or just enjoy the park. Uh, but so it would, where would that parking be? Um, it would Mark? be, the gate would be in off the road. So you, you could maybe get, say, four or five cars outside the gate. Okay. It's not a big park, um, but the, the cars would pull off the road into a parking area. And then just like any state park with a gate, you would then walk in. So that's our, and then obviously the owner of lot three would have access to the combination of the gate so they could open it for access themselves. But what we want, we, we, we're very concerned that it becomes a major party area at the waterfront and <laughs> controlling vehicles is the key to that. We don't want off-road vehicles down at the river driving around. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume for a moment that we will have our attorney workout language. Uh, I, I want to go back to the commission members uh, for some guidance. Uh, the non-exclusive uh, clause, I would assume that we would probably want to see that access language for the owner of lot three narrowed down so that it would be for 
some specific sort of uh, reason for the access, maintenance of that lower portion or recreational enjoyment. But in terms of, um, I'm not sure what the scope of the, uh, the, the well, what the, the interpretation of the proposed language would be. Uh, one of the concerns I have is if we don't have finalized language, do we want to vote on this when we close no. this public hearing? No, not without well, that final language, not in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I one do. Of the, yeah, I, that's why I, I read the uh, what I was proposing as, as part of the conditions of approval um, would be that the easements would be, uh, which we've done this many times in, since I've been um, working here, um, for several of the subdivisions, we've had easements that were, uh, uh, the, the concept of them was ironed out in the, by the commission. Then it, I would draft some, I've drafted something with uh, the town attorney, and then it comes back to the planning and zoning, and also the, uh, the property owner, the agent, um, and come to a, 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 an agreement on what it should be. And if there is no agreement, then the, then the the condition wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be met. So, okay, I, I'm taking a. We could also yeah. hold off. I'm I'm not saying we couldn't. Yeah, I, I we'll we'll talk about that. Anything else that the members of the public would like to bring up? I see other members here. Uh, Mr. Giuliano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Maybe I can, Sal Giuliano from Hop River LLC, maybe I can help alleviate some of the concerns because I think I, I, I think we share some of the concerns that have been expressed as well in terms of, of future access uh, to lot three. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you, you know, we've maintained the property and we certainly intend to continue to maintain lot three so it does not become uh, sort of a haven for abuses, um, whether it's what, whatever it might be. Um, so it's strictly for enjoyment of the owners of lot three. Um, I think I think sharing uh, security at the gate makes a lot of sense um, to Mr. Walter's um, point earlier. So whether it's a combination or key, whatever the case might be. Um, but I do want to just alleviate the concern that that um, that the, the back of lot three down by the river is going to become more than um, just you know simple uh, private recreation for the owners of that property. It's not going to be a racetrack. It's not going to turn into anything like that. So in terms of of language in the easements that uh, accomplish that, where we'll be supportive of that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else from the public? Just, just one thought that I had, and I, I'm going to share the concern that I had, and, and then my perspective has changed. I think this has been a very well presented application. I want to uh, commend the applicant and, and their representative. Uh, very competent, very well presented. Initially, my thoughts were, well, with all this uh, land area that's subtracted from the town's potential exclusive use, because it's it's a an access way, that really is not is not land that we should count toward the open space dedication because town can't do what they want with it. And I, I throw that out as a concept to discuss. But if you take a look here, it looks like there's about 200 linear feet, maybe 250 linear feet times 25. Uh, that that equates to 3,000 square feet. That's about a tenth of an acre. Um, it's a small additional amount. I'd have loved to have seen a little more river frontage to offset that uh, uh, that roadway that or or driveway, whatever you want to call it, that really can only be used for access. And after that, those for that first uh, short area where cars will be accessing to park, it becomes a, an access way for. The town to go in, but it's also an access way that they can never encumber in any way because the lot three owner has a right in perpetuity to use it, 25 foot wide access way. Um, 
given how cooperative the process has been, I'm inclined to suggest that we be flexible about that. But it's a concern that I didn't want to just poo poo and, and shoo away. So I'm just wondering what other commission members in the public thinks of that. Uh, because the open space dedication is at the statutory minimum within a you know a few square feet. Uh, and and when they reconfigured this, which was originally offered with more river frontage, but when this was reconfigured, uh, they uh, some of that river frontage was clawed back by the applicant. So I'm wondering what uh, what people think of that and whether the the current way of of dedicating this is acceptable, both to commission right. members, public, and of course the applicant. If you want to weigh in on what I've said, uh, but like I said, this has been a very well done application. I, we're, I think if if they've earned flexibility because of the quality of the presentation, um, it would be in this circumstance. Rick, I want to make a comment on that. I, I, I agree with you. I think um, at the end of the day, we can't forget what this is about. This is about the, the lot three owner getting access to their own property. And I think that the applicant has been, I'm sure it's been frustrating to go through this. Um, you know, uh, but I think that they've they've done a lot with with what they've done with this easement. But the second thing is, if if I've heard the, the term archaeological site used many many times, if we want to preserve an archaeological site, having a clear pathway, roadway easement, however you want to put it, may direct people in a manner and how they go through it away from the archaeological site, so they're not walking over it. Um, so I think that there, there's been concerns mentioned about the preservation of the archaeological site. I've never known an archaeological site that's been preserved by having people trample over it all the time and making it open space. And I think that a result of this easement may actually be to pre help preserve that because it's been preserved extremely well over the past 50 years under private ownership, in my view. So I agree with you. I think the applicant, not to be short about it, but I think the applicant has done enough. Um, I think that they have the future owner of that or whoever wants to get back to their own property should have the ability to do so. And I think that they've been uh, very accommodating in the situation that they've been put in. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in? Rich? Um, I actually think they're given a, a, a very good chunk of the property. As far as I'm concerned, that's that lot three, I think that's the best aspect of the property. And the town's getting most of the street frontage on that and half of the water frontage. If I own lot three, I want the, the water frontage. That, that's the appealing part of it. So I think, in my opinion, I think it's very generous to give that off their lot. To me, it's, like I said, is the most appealing part. And I think, the wording for open space is supposed to be a cross section. That really isn't a cross section of the property because you're given just one area. Um, I think it's better than a cross section because of your access and how, how well laid out it is for the town to use it however they choose. And <clears throat> the only thing I, I'm a little nervous about a gate, how do you keep people from parking in front of the gate? you know, that want to use the place, that's something that'll need to be addressed too, if you want to put a gate in there. Because if you get people parking in there, then going down, <clears throat> then they won't get access to their property. Just something to think about. Yep, and Mark, we trust. Yep. <laughs> hey, hey, Rick, oh, go ahead, Judy. Is there someone else? Judy, you want to speak to her, should I preempt her? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't hear hey, my, my Judy. comment. Judy, did you want to speak? No, not yet. You go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, all kidding aside here. Um, I guess maybe I misunderstood in the beginning. I thought there was point the the access to the for the public was going to be pretty much unlimited, and I could be wrong in that. But now it seems to be um, much more limited. Who can access? you know, access with the lock and the key and the whole bit. And the other thought that comes to my mind, these people have been good stewards of that property for the last 60, 60 years. And I understand that. Um, 
my questions are always going to be, what, what's it going to be like in 20 years from now or 30 years from now, we have totally different owners. Um, do we all feel we have enough constraints and controls over that, that access? I think that comes down to the verbiage of the, uh, the, the um, easement. And we'll rely on interacting with our town council to do that, which is why I would really prefer to see finalized easement language before we vote on it. I mean, I don't think there's any question that we're in favor of the subdivision in general. And I maybe I'm, I'm going a little farther beyond where we might normally go. There's no lack of that. But uh, until that language is finalized, you can't finalize a subdivision anyway. And I'd like that worked out because you know, I, I, I always prefer that we vote on something without a lot of conditions with everything set set up right. and, and, and there for us to evaluate as opposed to having a long list of conditions that still have yet to be satisfied. They couldn't file a mile hours anyway until all of those things are done. So that being said, uh, we, we, we can t discuss this as we get toward the end of the public hearing. Okay. Okay. I I guess I would just like to say that I'd want to thank everybody for Judy, being concerned. You, Judy, oh, Judy, Judy Ortiz, of... 15 Columbia Landing. And <laughs> I'd just like to thank everybody for being concerned about the historical significance of this site, um, which is uh, which is really a, an important um, you know, mill site that we should preserve. And whatever that whatever that takes to preserve it, I would like to see that happen. Thank you. Any anyone else uh, with something to say? Or why don't we um, move to close the public hearing? Um, unless there's any additional testimony or comment or questions, I, I think we have as much information as we need. Joan uh, has Joan? another question. Well, yeah, just a comment on the the road as it passes. Yeah, just through. for the record, I need you to say. Oh, sorry, Joan Hill, twenty three Cards Mill Road, Columbia. Um, I'm just looking at the right of way or the road as it passes through the meadow area north of the sluice after you cross. You know, the town is going to be putting in a lot more road than they need. They only need to actually get to the edge of the field to get their mowing machines in there, but they're actually carrying that road all the way to the boundary with the abutter. You know, the eastern portion that's being kept. Mm -hmm. So I, as a taxpayer, you know, we're Joan, paying for, excuse me. Oh, they're not, the town is not going to. Why do you let Joan finish, Paula, and then you can address okay. this when she's done. Well, I, don't, I don't care. I just, you know, I was looking at the expense of it and wondering if the uh, person using it would share in that cost of the extra road needed to get to their property. The town, from question noted. Okay. The town Paula. is planning on building the road across to the to the driveway, excuse me, to just across the sluice way and stop at that point, because then there's access to the field, period. Yeah. If lot three wants to continue the a driveway to their property, they would have to do that at their expense. Ah, that wasn't clear in the map. So okay, that's that's what I thought. That would be better. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. I'm I'm trying to move this along. Is there anything else anyone wants to bring up? Because what I'm going to suggest is that we close the public hearing. We'll open it up to commission uh, debate, but uh, any. Do we need an extension on this one, Rick? No, we're gonna, if we close a public hearing tonight, then what, Paula, we have 65 days to make a decision? Uh, yes, we have 65 days. You know, I don't intend to take that long. I would, I would, I'm going to suggest that we close the public hearing tonight because tonight is the, the last day that we can keep the public hearing open without an extension. And I don't think we really need an extension. Uh, I would just, and then I, I would ask that by our next meeting, uh, I, I would suggest that we um, postpone taking a vote on this until our next meeting uh, so that at that time we will have finalized um, easement language in place uh, and finalized language for the temporary easement. I really, I don't wanna vote on something without seeing the language. I'd really like to have some language proposed, a way, way that it would terminate cleanly so it isn't a lingering easement over the, the part of the land uh, that is not currently de designated for the permanent driveway. So Good for me. Whether, whether it's a time frame, uh, 
probably I, we'd ask uh, our town administrator to weigh in on that. I know there's no guarantee as to the time uh, for us to put the town improvements in. So that being said, uh, we would need to work out language so that that we don't have a lingering other easement that's there forever also. I can address that, Rick, if you like. Yeah, that would be great if you could, Mark. And so the, the walkthrough with the public works director, Beth Lunt, uh, was that this is a perfect project to build a driveway with town gravel during the winter. And if we have a winter like we've had the last two winters, that's that's a great project. But if it's all of a sudden crazy winter with four feet of snow, um, it might get delayed till one year. Uh, so that, that was just the thought process there, that okay. we want to do this when there's not a lot of road and drainage work that we do normally during our season. And um, I, I'd be happy to work with the owners on language for developing the gate and the access because we both have the same desire to protect the property. And um, I think access is available by foot and by bicycle whenever. It's just vehicle access that can ruin a, a property in a, in a very short period of time. And that's what we want to control. And whether that's a gate with ballards to protect so no one can park in front of the gate, um, or threat of being towed, we, we can work that out, but um, I, I'd be happy to work with the owners. Okay, I, I'd love if we could visually see where the temporary access is. I don't wanna make them redo their plot plan because I think the plot plan will likely be acceptable as it's presented this evening. Uh, I don't wanna add to more engineering costs for the applicant. I think the temporary access is the existing access. Okay. So the motivation to build this, the new driveway is to get it off of the um, historical property. So I'll le we'll lean on you and you and Paula to interface with our town attorney to come up with a language that's mutually agreeable that'll get presented uh, to the, the, the applicant. I would agree, that'd be fine. Okay, I would leave it in your hands. Anything else anyone would like to bring up? Because I'm going to suggest the next motion is to close the public hearing. So I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing. Second that. Yeah, second. Okay, Alex, thank you. Any discussion on that? All those in favor of closing the public hearing? That looks to be unanimous. Uh, Vera, were you yep. in favor of that? Okay, that yes. would make it unanimous. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just say for the record, I really, um, from this point, it'll be commission only discussion when we move into our unfinished business. Uh, well, I, I, whatever I have to say, I can do when we do that. So we're going to move from the public hearing into item six in our regular agenda, unfinished business, uh, discussion, possible action on the Hop River LLC four lot subdivision application on Hop River Road. Property address 127 Route 6, Assessor's Map 8, Lot 16A. I would suggest that I, I don't have really any reservations. I'm very comfortable with the application, but I really don't want to vote on this without that permanent, um, like the, the language for the permanent easement and the temporary easement uh, for us to evaluate or, or craft. And so, Absent having all of that after the review by our town attorney. And uh, Joan Hill brought up some really valid points that I would want to have taken into account by the town attorney. Um, the, the verbiage non-exclusive, unrestricted, and things like that. Those are things that uh, we would want to work out something that's reasonable for the owner of lot three, but also protects the town interest. And to that end, I would expect I would hope that Paula Stahl would weigh in and Mark Walter would weigh in and then have an, uh, Paula can have an interaction with the applicant or the applicant's representative. But I don't see any problem coming up with something that's very reasonable and, and uh, mutually advantageous. We, I think we all have the same goals here. So, I, so I'm suggesting that we defer action uh, to our next meeting, but really put the pressure on to get things resolved so that approximately two weeks from now at our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting, we can take action on this with without a long list of conditions that aren't 
that I don't want to craft conditions last minute at this meeting. I'd, if there's any conditions, we'll do it in a memorandum that that goes out to us um, in advance that encompasses everything. Any thoughts on that from commission members? I agree with that, Rick. It needs to be timely for the applicant and everyone involved. Yeah, I, you know, worst case, even if we we were going to take action with conditions, it, we're still going to be working details out up till two weeks from now, and we'd have to sign off on those conditions. Uh, so, you know, I I, I want to say again what I said. It, it's um to the to the applicant and to their representative, Mr. Wentworth. I really want to say thank you. This is a very nice application. You did a, a really, really good job on it. And it's, um, I can't say enough about it. And, and you know, I've got to, uh, all the other, the constituents and, and members of the, the Columbia um, community that, that work, the Historic Commission, the Conservation Commission, did I miss anybody? I don't think so. Thank you for all the input. I mean, this is going to be, this will be the best we can do when we're done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Okay, uh, so we're going to continue uh, this for action to our next regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, that is, what's the date of that flow? 26. 726 at 7 p.m. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you again, everybody. Uh, so this, uh, next up is item seven, new business. Thank you. We have no new business. Okay. Uh, do you want to go over regulation revisions? Have, have you done anything with her? Let's defer till after we're done with this uh, subdivision application, Paula. Um, we have a couple things. Again, that... I'm asking if you, want, you would like to bring up anything. Um, under the some of the legislative changes, um, we don't need to do it tonight, but we need to um, um, make some decisions about um, um, any um, action that we would that the town would want to take in terms of um, uh, uh, not allowing certain things or um, uh, okay. To, so what Paul what we is need talking to take about that. is one of the things that was permitted as of July 1 was marijuana dispensary sales um, and it's a retail use. So technically if somebody came forward now with an application in our retail district or our, our commercial district, um, it would be a permitted use. And the question would be whether we want more control over it. We have the option of more control, uh, no control, pro prohibition, a lot of things. Um, if an application were to come forward right away, uh, it would basically basically be a permitted application. There is not an unlimited number because I believe what was approved is one per 25,000 residents. So the first person to come forward with a dispensary um, application, if that's the right term for retail uh, sales, uh, would almost automatically, we just basically have to approve it. And do, would we be comfortable anywhere in our commercial zone with that? If we feel we need to take some action about that, great. If you don't, um, I think the thing to do tonight is to, to get a, a, a polling of, of members. Is there something that we wanna do about it or is there nothing that we wanna do about it? Um, I think we should have some idea of kind of kick around what we might be in for. I think a lot of people are gonna take the fact that marijuana is, is going to be, is, is legal. Uh, they're just they're going to press the issue, so you, I think you have to have some idea of what parameters are and and have some uh, forethought on how to handle that. Rick, you said that they would legally only be allowed one one location anyway in a town. One location side. in town, if that's if I understand the state statutes accurately. The state statute was uh, modified as of J July 1 of this year. There's actually some question that uh, Rich Roberts has come up with as to um, the, the law is written the same as the alcohol limitation in terms of a liquor store that could be in a particular town. Um, you have to have uh, 2,500 
people in town before you can have a liquor store. If you have 2,000 people in your town, you uh, cannot have a liquor store. Um, we can have, uh, Columbia can have two because we're over 5,000. This language is the same. So Rich Roberts is posing that perhaps if a town does not have 25,000, you don't, you cannot have one. I don't think that was the intent of the, the, the legislature, um, but we don't know until somebody challenges it. Let, um, let's assume for the moment that, that one would be permitted under the current statute yeah, as it yeah. was modified July 1. The question is, is there any desire on our part to take any action to have a moratorium, a prohibition, or is there no desire to take any action? That's a, a question for the commission members that um, I don't, you know, the, the question gets to be one more, I think, of safety and control based on if one of the first dispensaries in the area were in Columbia, there would be traffic jams and lines for some foreseeable future until the saturation level in adjoining towns was reached. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the first time Krispy Kreme donuts opened up in Newington. It's, uh, and I, I don't mean to make light of this, but that's, it, it was hellacious until people got tired of Krispy Kreme donuts. And I think it would be it would most closely replicate what's done with, with liquor stores. So I, I, I guess from my point of view, it would be a matter of kind of look, looking where the similarities are and not reinventing the wheel. Um, I mean, anything can happen in the future. If we were the very first one to get a dispensary or whatever the business would be, yeah, there'd be traffic. It'd be good for the other businesses. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, I just I think that there's probably some things we could compare it to and, and uh, be you know take action from there or or at least evaluate it. It's probably I guess better what I'm trying to say. Mr. Walter or Rich, I'll, I'll I I'll let you go next after what Mark Rich. Okay, Mark. Um, I sat through three hour presentation from all uh, fire marshal, um, building inspector and chief of police of Denver when they were the first to go down this road. And it's the uh, retail dispensary is not the issue. It's more um, having zoning regulations for the growing and the extraction of the HTC from the marijuana it's because the growing of the marijuana in greenhouses, they often supplement a lot of extra CO2 to accelerate the growing of marijuana. So the fire departments had to get outfitted with CO2 detectors so they could understand the intensity of the CO2 before they went into a building. And the extraction, the ATC, uh, not ATC, ATC. THC. 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 The extraction often required freezing and um, heating to remove it, but that often uh, caused um, explosions and fires if that process wasn't done right, which is why the fire marshal needs to be really involved in that. And huh. all I'm saying is there's unintended consequences when we go down this road where I don't think the retail selling of it is the problem. It's the growing extraction. And I talked to Portland, the first select woman. They were one of the first towns to have this. And the, the actual burning of the marijuana to make marijuana was um, the fumes were hitting the neighborhoods. Um, and that was becoming an issue. So they outgrew their facility and moved out of Portland. So the problem went away. But these are the unattended things you might not have thought about. Hmm. That's all I have for it. So, um, uh, Rich, you had something? Um, it was more about the dispensaries. I don't think, personally, think Columbia would be one of the first towns to get one because the people who are going to want to open up are going to be closer to higher populations for sales. And from everything I'm gathering also to grow, you need to purchase quite an expensive license. I believe I heard the number was around a million dollars just to have permission. And everything has to be done indoors based on our state laws. 
It's not like some states where they can grow outdoors, which opens up a whole nother can of worms and concerns for neighborhoods and, and people and stealing things like well, that. Let's let's um start a process and and uh, analyze this and, and gather information. Anything that you could bring to bear, Mark, would be appreciated. Um, if if maybe we need to address um, a higher level of review for cannabis cultivation, um, we can turn something around like that quickly. We would want to make sure it's in an appropriate location, uh, especially if it was adjacent to a residential location. Maybe the re the retail um, regulations as they sit are are sufficient to address whatever concerns we do or don't have. Um, think just let's start a conversation amongst each other and with all of uh, all of our uh, the people that support us, Mark, Paula, um, and ask everybody to weigh in on this. And let's continue the discussion to our next meeting. But we started the discussion tonight. And Mark, your input about the dispense, not the, uh, the cult cultivation maybe being the thing that needs attention to protect the public from adjacent, especially adjacent residential property owners or from fumes. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm glad it's legalized, but I also don't want it imposed on people that don't want it. Just like I don't want a bar right next to somebody's home unless the bar was there first. So what I'm getting at is, you know, part of our charge is to protect people and allow them to have their quiet enjoyment of their property. And if that's, um, that's what we do. And any thoughts any of you have, um, you share them with each other or bring them to the next meeting. Anything you want to bring up tonight? I don't want, I just, this is starting a discussion and it, it's, I uh, appreciate Paula, Paula brought it up to me. So this really started with Paula and Paula, thank you for bringing it up. But I really want this to be the product of what any or no, none of your concerns are as commission members. Any, any thoughts? Uh, anything else on the legislative update that might need attention from us, Paula? Uh, there's one other thing. It's uh, there's actually a couple of things that's not quite as as pressing as the um, uh, cannabis, but the um, uh, they're now mandating accessory dwelling units, which we already have. Uh, we allow a, an accessory use uh, dwelling unit currently. Um, our regs are very similar to what they're requiring. However, um, we do require that the, the accessory dwelling unit be within an existing house or in a, in, within a, a connected to a, a single family home or uh, a a building on the property that has a, a primary use. So the garage or into a garage or a barn. Um, there, the, this law now is, is uh, mandating that um, accessory dwelling unit could be a separate building on the, on the property. So it changes the complex of the town a little bit. Um, it's something for, for you to think about we have until January 1st to opt out of this section. Um, I don't think that it would make that big of a difference, but I don't, I don't know the history of why the, the uh, commission uh, had made it so that it was set to, uh, it had to be in a, in a, within another building on the property. Um, so think, we opted think about out, this we opted one. out last time. That was a different, that different was the caretaker. The um, granny flats. Granny flats. Yeah. Yeah. Let, it was think about, let's just start start a discussion with this tonight. If you want to bring anything up tonight, please go ahead. But I, I really just want to make sure that these topics are not new to us on the night that we start to dig in to discuss them. Uh, I, I, so I think what we should do is evaluate whether we want to opt out of the state requirement or just leave it and let it be. I've always wondered why if somebody wanted to have a second single family home on their lot, why that was a bad thing. Maybe we decide that it can, you have to have a certain amount of acreage in order to have that second single family dwelling and it has to have its own separate septic system. Those are things that we can start a discussion about and dig into in the future. We have time between now and January 1. 
but think about those things in that context. Do we like things as they are now, or do we want to broaden this? You know, through this pandemic, we've seen lots of households combine into in, uh, two households trying to consolidate because cost of housing is ridiculous. You know, how do we make things more affordable for people? And is that our charge? So just throwing out a lot of concepts and, and anything anyone else would throw out, I would appreciate. But, um, and you didn't mention anything, anyone want to bring anything up on this or we'll defer to another evening and we're going to dig into this in a lot more depth. Paul, what was it? Was there one other topic you? There's a there's a couple others in here. Um, just to touch on, um, we now have to incorporate in our zoning regulations um, um, multifamily housing apartments uh, somewhere in town, um, and it there it's um, the legislation is structured so that, um, and I'm sure it's some of the wealthier towns on the other end of the state have been doing this where, oh yes, you can have multifamily housing, but you have to have, you know, 500 acres or, or whatever. You, you, the hurdles are, they say yes, but the hurdles are so high, nobody can, can get, get over them. Um, so the, the, we have to uh, include multifamily housing within our, in our um, uh, regulations and um, the, uh, um, we also have to, by June 1st of next year, we have to have a, uh, an affordable housing plan adopted. And then we have to do another one every five years. And the housing plan is um, fairly detailed. Um, the ones that I've seen- Are paid by the state to do this? Um, there are some grants to do that. Um, you know, that, that, that's news I'd love to review at a different time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, um, a couple other, one other thing, um, is just that we need to, to take a look at our regulations and anytime we, we refer to, uh, the character of a community, we need to be able to define what the character means. I think when we're saying character, we're talking about the, the current density and height of the, the buildings that are, that are in that town, in that section of town. Um, in other towns, character um, is, is a little more, um, uh, not on, is, is more about the, the people that are living there. <laughs> Um, and the other thing is they're now requiring that commissioners have training and that's all of us because uh, I'm a commissioner in my town as well um, so we need to have uh, every two years starting um, in by next January a year from a year from January two, almost two years from now uh, we have to have training um, and it's four hours of training and at least one hour has to be on affordable and fair housing policies. And Flo will have the job of keeping track of the fact that we've done it and we have to report to our board of selectmen that we've been trained. Has anything started to fall out about the training procedures? What, meaning we've had some other um, seminars that we've had that were multi-town efforts, you know, think about uh, uh, he Andover, Hebron, Columbia. It's uh, a Lebanon. great idea. Yeah. You know, put having, a, to get um, them having together. Some, some yep. Newman's Hall where we put on, get a program put together and invite commission members from other towns. Uh, it's, a, it's a great event where you can compare notes. You know, when we go to the legal seminar that they put on at Wesleyan every two years by the Connecticut Bar Association, it's a great networking event where you see other commission commissioners from other towns and you know you start to compare notes and you realize how very different we are in some ways and how very similar we are in most of the ways. Um, and th that might be a, a great reaching out and 
maybe an informal understanding that we rotate responsibility for putting these on every couple of years. So, but, you know, maybe once every eight or 10 years, Columbia does it for a four town group. You get 40 or 50 commissioners in, in, in the same place uh, so that we can hear with the, uh, you know, a four hour presentation. Maybe we agree to share the cost four ways each time that that occurs, if there's any real cost at all. Because we can probably get attorneys willing to speak on this uh, for no charge. I would, you know, I think something will start to shake out. I'm sure you'll have a lot more for us on this as we go forward, Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the Yukon's Land Use uh, Academy uh, will be putting together packages too, so that, um, and they've got online. So it doesn't have to be as done as a group, although I, I do like the idea of a group because you, I think you gain from, from hearing other people's questions that when you're taking a, doing an online seminar all by yourself, you don't have the opportunity to, to uh, um, ask questions and, and hear what somebody else is asking for a question. So, so we'll I think continue would, this discussion. You know, maybe starting um, uh, uh, keep 8-1 um, on the agenda each meeting over the next many meetings. Okay. And then maybe have... Um, uh, uh, subsections 81A, B, C, D, so we outline what it is we're going to need to pay attention to. Okay, um, great. That might be helpful. Okay. Uh, we haven't, uh, we, we kind of, uh, well, we all set on legislative update items. Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, so for item 82, discussion of the subdivision oh, regulation yeah. revisions. You know, we, we, we talked about it, uh, a subcommittee. Yes, Mark? I think he was saying goodbye. Oh, I think he was saying oh, goodbye. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> he was waving. I thought it was a frantic wave. It was a, a, a calm wave. Um, so the discussion on subdivision regulation revisions going forward, um, we'll get our subcommittee working. Uh, did we... Set in stone who was on the subcommittee. I think I volunteered. Yeah, we we did. Um, I I'm not going to have much time to to prep for a subcommittee. I I don't want you guys to be meeting without, you know, something that is going to be productive. Um, so that may be a little while I'll, with all I'll these other changes. With you, Paul, who's on this on the subcommittee? It's myself. Uh, you, Vera, Larry was the backup, and. No, I don't remember. Volunteer too. Just, Justin, too. yes, Justin. Yeah. Justin. Justin, okay. Okay. Yeah, just Flo, if you could make note of who's on the committee, yep. sub, the subcommittee, and then we'll we'll start to get something rolling in the next four weeks or so. Uh, next up is item nine, communications and reports. Anything, Paula? Nothing from me. Okay, anything anyone wants to bring up? Open discussion, commission open discussion. Uh, we're gonna go into executive session very briefly to get an update uh, to the extent that we have it about the pending legal action. I'm gonna move on to audience of citizens. Uh, anything from anyone? There's no one left, I don't think. There is one. Oh, that's uh, Vera's phone number, okay. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that we move into executive session. Do we need a motion for that? I don't know if that we need a motion, but we need to state what time it is. Right. Okay, so we're stating it's at 8.11 p.m. We're moving yeah. into executive session.